My name is Oren Kerr. I'm a law professor at George Washington University here in Washington, D.C. I knew I wanted to clerk after law school in part because when I was in law school, I just loved legal questions. I was one of those folks that enjoyed law school. I thought my classes were great. I wanted to talk about law after class and before class. Uh, and so, you know, everybody I had spoken to said, well, you should do an appellate clerkship. It's kind of like a, you know, graduate degree on top of a JD and you'll get to really experience legal questions. So, so I applied for uh, clerkships and accepted a position with uh, Judge Leonard Garth on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, who at the age of, I think, 93 now is still hearing cases. I just spoke to him a few days ago. Uh, and uh, and it, was a, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, you know, after clerking, I remember speaking with uh, other law clerks and other folks in my law school class who'd recently been clerking. And one of the issues that we talked about was, to what extent is the law political? You know, to what extent is a judge's liberal conservative views, how much does that impact? their decisions. And I remember speaking to a law school friend who clerked on another circuit, and his response was it was all political. Uh, the liberal judges voted the liberal way, the conservative judges voted the conservative way. Uh, and my experience was just completely different. Uh, Judge Garth would go where the cases took him, and that's how he decides cases, and it was all on the record, and it was very much uh, the way things are supposed to be, the way, you know, that's 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 the sort of the sunny version of how, how law is supposed to work. And, and it was how it worked. So it was, I mean, it was wonderful. He's just really I intensely involved in the process and has very strong views and is looking at the cases and is looking at the record and active in oral argument. It was a, it was a great experience. So, so that experience was really a, a heartening one in a lot of ways. It was one in which, you know, gave me a lot of confidence uh, 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 about how the legal system worked. Although, as I mentioned, you know, other, other friends of mine had a different experience, so it really varies judge to judge. Yeah, the Supreme Court wasn't really on my radar screen when I was uh, clerking for Judge Garth. I guess it, it started to be. I, my first year law school grades were not particularly good. I didn't, I didn't get it. I was thinking of law school exams like they were engineering exams, and I wanted to find the correct engineering answer, which is a terrible approach for a law school exam. And, and by my second year, I realized what I was doing wrong. So my second and third year uh, exams were, were much better. My grades were much higher. Um, but I wasn't one of those uh, folks who aced their first year, and I wasn't on law review, and it didn't, I didn't really think applying to the Supreme Court was particularly realistic. Um, I ended up applying anyway. My, I guess I applied when I was clerking for Judge Garth, uh, and much to my astonishment, had one interview with Chief Justice Rehnquist. I think it was about nine minutes long. I was pretty clear at that point I was not going anywhere. So that was fine. That sort of restored my sense of normal order in the universe that I was not going to get that job. Uh, and then I went to the Justice Department uh, and ended up teaching for two years and then applied again uh, to clerk. And that was mostly kind of on a, on a lark. I had a friend who was a law clerk, uh, a very good friend, who, who was enjoying the job at the Supreme Court so much. And she said, why don't you apply? Uh, and I thought, okay, well, you know, I had some sort of inside connection maybe. And, and uh, uh, that was the thought. And so I applied and I didn't hear anything for about 10 months and actually had kind of forgotten that I had applied when... Uh, I got a call from a former law clerk to Justice Kennedy uh, who invited me in for an interview. And I'll, I'll be honest, I, I didn't know what the interview was about uh, because I had, it had been 10 months or so uh, since I had uh, uh, applied. Uh, and I was also, it was in the middle of uh, a lot of discussions at the time I was involved in, involving the Patriot Act and was doing a lot of interviews at the time about the Patriot Act. Uh, and I didn't know, you know, it was just an interview about the Patriot Act. And then I finally realized, no, this is actually a, a clerkship interview. So, so I, was, I was quite surprised by that and ended up uh, getting the job and then taking a year off from teaching and then going right back to teaching after the clerkship. Oh, that's a really interesting question. Let me think about that. So, so did I feel prepared? Um, okay, I'll answer it on, on the record as these <laughs> things go. Uh, yeah, I suppose I did feel prepared. Uh, I, I was a little bit non-traditional. I, I had clerked for a circuit judge like most people had. Uh, and then uh, I had been a prosecutor for three years and taught for two years. So I had 
much more of a legal background than than most of the law clerks. I was at a little bit of a disadvantage because there had been legal developments that everybody else had been following that I hadn't. So, for example, the EDPA, the, the habeas statute, had been passed in 96. Uh, and when I had taken federal courts uh, in the spring of uh, 1997, uh, Professor Fallon had said, there's this new statute, you know, don't worry about it, we're not going to cover it much because nobody has any idea what it means. And meanwhile, the other law clerks uh, when I arrived in the fall of 2003, uh, they had all been, you know, reading all the cases. They were up on the latest cases interpreting the statute, which for me was new. So I was a little bit behind on my EDPA uh, cases. But beyond that, I mean, law, law is law. Uh, and so it was, uh, you know, I, I jumped into the work and it was, it was pretty fascinating work. The day-to-day -day, uh, job of being a law clerk in part depends on what job you have that day. So you start off doing a lot of work on uh, cert pool memos, uh, memos uh, that are to all of the justices, uh, helping them figure out whether they want to grant cert or deny cert uh, on, on particular cases before them. Uh, and in some ways, that was work that at the time I think, I think struck me as um, you know, not as valuable. It's not merits work. Sort of you, you sort of imagine that it's working on the merits of cases is really the, the, the sort of glory part of, of the job. But, but uh, looking back on it, the time working on cert pool memos was actually tremendously valuable because by the end of the year, you know what the justices care about in terms of taking cases or not taking cases. Uh, and as an outsider of the Supreme Court or a sometime litigant before the Supreme Court, it's getting the Supreme Court to take cases. Uh, or trying to get them not to take cases, which in some ways is the most important thing that the lawyers do. So once a case is granted, there's uh, amici uh, and their merits briefs, and the quality of the lawyering at the Supreme Court is usually very good. Uh, but the merits, you know, it's up to the nine justices as to what they want to do. Um, influencing what cases the courts take and understanding that cert standard, which really gets sort of beaten into you as a law clerk, uh, was tremendously valuable looking back on it. I mean, I can certainly talk about what I think is the most important or the less important. On the merits, I think the most important ingredient are just the merits briefs. Uh, there's nothing like the opportunity of the petitioner and the respondent to speak directly to the justices. You know, every justice and every law clerk on every case is going to, they're going to read those merits briefs. Uh, and in the case of the United States, which of course has kind of an unusual position, any amicus brief that the United States files is going to be read very carefully too. And everything else is going to be read, but I think it's, it's, the, it's the party's briefs that really get underlined and just read over and over again and are really sort of, uh, they're, they're the beginning of the conversation. They really frame the conversation. Uh, oral argument plays an important role, although often it's a different role. I mean, I, th I think part of the purpose of oral argument is for the justices to see how each other comes out, uh, to get a sense of where the votes are, uh, and perhaps to try to influence some votes that may be in play. There are a lot of questions at oral argument that are kind of strategic questions, sort of, let, let me ask a question to, just in case the centered justice hasn't thought of this issue. Um, and oftentimes it's even to think about how the opinion might work. So you'll, you'll see this at, at oral arguments uh, uh, in, in some cases where uh, maybe 20 minutes into the 30 minutes of questioning, there will be a question along the lines of, let's say we write the opinion for your side or for the other side, how should we do this? And that, that's almost the beginning of the justices conference, I think, where the justices are thinking aloud, talking to each other about how to resolve the case. And th that's a tremendously important part of the process. And, and a lot of people think oral argument is, is irrelevant. I don't, I don't think so at all. I think oral argument is, is critical. It often is not as much critical to who wins or loses as it is to how the opinion comes out, which, which I think is a part of the litigation process, which, which people don't quite give the attention to that it deserves. So which side wins or loses is, is obviously very important, but is it going to be a broad opinion? Is it going to be a narrow opinion? Does the opinion write on a constitutional question, on the statutory question? Is it, you know, a case-by-case -case 
interstitial issue? Does the court hand down a major rule? Even issues like how are the facts described in the case? Are they described very broadly, very narrowly? Um, all of these issues go into the importance of the case, and oftentimes those sorts of questions are focused during oral argument. So I think oral argument is actually quite important.